practice developer relations at Edge and Node, developer success. And this is going to be a quick start uh, to subgraph development and querying, really getting you guys started for the hackathon as soon as possible. And the best way to get started with subgraphs is to start from the beginning, and that's uh, really understanding uh, where you are in the hackathon. So if you would like to scan this to understand our prizes, also to have a ha uh, hacker help telegram group, quick start videos, repos, these slides, I really uh, tried to put a lot of information in this QR code. So that can be very helpful for you. And once I see phones down, I will move on. Boom, boom, everyone got it? Phone up, okay, I got you. All right. And real quick, I'll go over the prizes for subgraphs as well. Uh, three main prizes. We got best new subgraph with those prizes, best use of existing subgraph, and then pool prize. Also, we just announced substreams literally yesterday. So if you want to dive into substreams and what that is, that's also in this QR code. Substreams are cool. That's the summary. Dive in if you can. It's the same QR code as before. The do. If you already got it. You got it? All right, so if anyone wants to live code, you can join, join along right here, and then this is the repo with all the links. No more QR codes after this, I promise. We'll just get through all this real quick. All right, everyone's good. Let's go for it. So this workshop, there's going to be an introduction. Oh, sure, I got you. <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, I'll wait, I'll wait. Workshop repo, live coding links. Pretty much if you want to do this along with me or have anything that you learned from today, be displayed in front of you, we use that. All right, phone, there we go. No more QRs, I promise. <laughs> All right, so this workshop overview, uh, it's gonna be an introduction to the graph we'll start with, then what exactly are subgraphs, we're gonna define those. We'll actually deploy a subgraph live. We'll compare queries with two different subgraphs. We'll use a subgraph that is pointed to a smart contract, and we'll use another subgraph that's a little bit more well built out, looking at the exact same contract, and we'll see how it's a little bit different. And then finally, we'll finish with a little plug for Scaffoldy 2.0, which connects very nicely with subgraphs now, which is pretty cool. So let's get into the introduction to the graph. First thing, when you go to thegraph.com, you see this, access the world's blockchain data. So let's dive into that. Really, the data storage of a uh, smart contract is very similar to this. It's just very, very isolated. If you only look at it in its one point, However, if you want to understand how that smart contract has existed in time, how do you actually do that? How do you look at how it has existed over time stamps? Well, you want to know about the provenance. You want to know about the history. You want to index that data. So something like this, very simple, but we're actually looking back in time just like this Apple uh, mock-up for the uh, backups. And really, we're seeing this kind of data layer backing up, backing up, backing up over time and having all of this time-stamped information over time in a disorganized way just because it's so right-optimized. We have so much data being piped in in any given second that has no organization. It needs indexing, all right? So that eventually you think is an issue. Well, there's also another issue. We have a read issue with the blockchain where if we're going to be writing to the blockchain so disorganized, okay, so that's fine we're going to be getting a lot of data back also. It's not just a write issue, it's a read issue. We've got disorganization on the way in and a lot coming back out. For example, who here used Instagram today? Anybody? Who posted on Twitter today? Anybody? I posted on Twitter. There we go, Twitter. All right, so that was one post, that was one write, and how many followers do you have or anyone have? You know, 1,500 followers, that's potentially 1,000 reads to one write. And that's the exact same thing we're seeing with data retrieval from the blockchain. So it's a problem. So there's a Web 2.5 solution for reading, which is centralized indexing. Indexing being organizing of the data. And that works, it totally does. You're able to get your data from a certain block and actually get it to your front end, totally fine. However, if that centralized indexing service goes down for whatever reason, we are sad. That's not a fun time, okay? So the question was in the beginning, getting introduced to the graphs, the Web 3.0 read solution, we have a lot of indexers working permissionlessly in the graph ecosystem, and they are all providing you options for your data retrievals, all right? So they're all indexing that same data piece that you want on the blockchain, and you can get it through the graph, and that's the graph right there. So if any of the indexers, for whatever reason, go down, you have other options, okay? All permissionlessly working through the tokenomic system of the graph. So I love this. Hope you guys do too. So. <laughs> 
it really pro provides a foundation for truly decentralized apps. If you're really needing indexing, you want to be decentralized and have that security guarantee. Also with incredible uh, speed and uptime, it really is there. That is the graph network, 450 indexers worldwide. It's permissionless, redundant, uh, fast, cheap, and reliable, and a global API. So let's go into subgraphs. Who here has heard of subgraphs, built with subgraphs? Okay. Who here has never built with subgraph before? Cool. Awesome. So we're just getting started. Awesome. So we now know we are swimming in blockchain data all the time as developers. It's disorganized horribly, but we can index it. How is that happening? This is basically what a subgraph does. It takes all the data and puts a nice, clean little bucket. That's basically it. All right. So let's go ahead and put this to words. Subgraphs are permissionless, customizable instructions for indexers to organize your data. If you build these instructions, awesome. They are going to be sent to indexers for you to get your data back. And here's basically the pathway it goes through. You have on-chain data and off-chain data. That's IPFS that is available today. And it goes into subgraph.yaml, which is your manifest. All right, you define exactly how your subgraph should uh, look like from a high level. And then it gets a little bit more into like a medium level almost. It's kind of like the mappings and the logic. And then eventually you present your data. You have your schema, which you send queries to, and they're nice, clean little buckets. Okay. And when you have that, all of these subgraphs exist in a permissionless market. Each of these subgraphs are valuable and have incentivizations mechanisms that exist within the tokenomic system of the graph. It's super duper cool. So that's a high level overview. It can go super deep into this, but we'll just keep on going about how subgraphs work. Eventually, it all comes to this. You guys want query responses. So we use GraphQL, send out a query, and then we enjoy that. So that's the high level uh, summary of the graph and subgraphs. One, point, uh, one to two billion queries per day are running through the graph. There's over a thousand subgraphs published on the graph network, which is super cool. Those are the individual subgraphs in the marketplace. And there's over 450 indexers. Okay, um, I said no more QR codes. I lied, you could take that or not. That's fine. <laughs> but I won't, oh, I'm, okay, I feel bad now. <laughs> All right. All right, once falls down. Okay, nice, on time. Okay, so let's go ahead and get into the code. We're gonna deploy a starter subgraph and then we're gonna compare that to a published, uh oh, there we go, stop. We're gonna uh, compare that to a published subgraph that's both subgraphs are gonna be looking at the same smart contract. So you can see how different it's gonna be to get data back from a basic subgraph. This is the subgraph that we're going to play. Thank you guys. Uh, that we're going to be comparing our starter subgraph to. We're going to look at a little bit more well built out subgraph. So you have a learning environment where you can see a basic one and a little bit more advanced one. Um, to start, we'll go to the graph.com slash studio if anyone's cool. Sing along. And also mini scan. All these links are available um, to pop into. And throughout this little next section, all you're going to do is just trace the punk transfer event. That's all I want. And we're going to look how the punk transfer event goes all the way to your schema.graphql. From there, you'll learn how a subgraph functions. Let's deploy a subgraph, everyone. So what we're going to start with is we will go to the graph.com and we'll make this a little bigger. We'll go to products, subgraph studio, and we're going to create a subgraph. And we'll call it live ETH global Paris demo. And we know this smart contract that I'm going to be indexing, like I said, is CryptoPunks. We know it's on Ethereum, so I chose Ethereum. And then we have this dashboard pop up. And you're free to actually populate this as you would like. Like I said, these subgraphs exist in a marketplace, so other people will see them. It's good to have good documentation and also good dashboard uh, etiquette. So fill that out if you are looking to join in a published uh, way. Let's go ahead and initialize the subgraph. So... Go into this, copy, paste, and we'll go Ethereum. Automatically populates the subgraph slug from the actual CLI, and then it'll create a directory automatically as well. We know this is on mainnet, so we'll select mainnet. Now we find the contract address. So I've already pulled up the CryptoPunks uh, smart contract address, and I'm going to bring that right in here. It's going to fetch the ABI automatically. Sometimes, depending on the chain, there might be an issue with that, and that's okay. There's totally a solution for this. You need to get the ABI manually, so you'll actually go to Miniscan, which is all linked in the repo, and you can get all that information very easily. So you go to Ethereum, put in the contract address. I love Miniscan. Of course, you can go to Etherscan, but it provides everything right there in front of you. Very useful for subgraph development. Miniscan is awesome. You got the ABI, the code, all the different events, which are awesome. So 
Let's go ahead and go back. There we go. It did it automatically. It automatically also found the start block in which the smart contract was initially deployed. So you don't want to index from smart uh, from uh, block zero. You want to go where the smart contract was deployed, finds it for you, and then the contract name. Once again, etiquette, because we are making a subgraph that is public, we want to actually have good naming. So guess what the name of the smart contract is? It's right there in Miniscan. So copy and paste. A lot of copying and pasting. We try to make this as easy as possible for you guys to get up and run. Okay, index contract events as entities. This is when we're going to be talking about that kind of portal that goes through the subgraph and how we define it, how we have the mappings, and then we get the schema. This is automatically generating that for you right now. Crossing fingers on the Wi-Fi. We'll see. We'll see. All right. So while that is spinning up, we'll see. There we go. Okay, awesome. So here we could also add more contracts we're not going to do this this is just a starter subgraph press no now it has information on the cli you could follow through i personally like to go right back to my dashboard and bigger just copy paste once again a lot of copy pasting authenticating your cli paste authenticated and enter the subgraph paste very easy and then CodeGen, which is actually compile, uh, it's actually doing type safety, and then graph build is compiling. So we have that going through, putting everything together, and then now we'll deploy. All right. Awesome. Zero point zero point one. So, uploading to IPFS, and there we go. The dashboard. Uh oh. All right, that's okay. We'll just keep on going. So, just in case this happened, I have a recording of this. Go. We'll just go through this together. Like so. So, we got right to here. Ba -ba 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 -ba, to the deploy. And that was not working very well earlier, so I was having some difficulty on that. All right. We went through this, went through this, and here we are. Uh, okay, so we got the deploy going through. So at this point, we have the dashboard loaded, and we could actually see the different entities that have been populated. Let's go ahead and dive into those entities right now through VS Code. Do you guys see that? Cool. So I'll just look at the screen, we'll go through this together. So... We have the subgraph.yaml, which is also known as the manifest of the subgraph. It really defines at a high level what the subgraph is. I'm opening up all the three files right here so we could all just go one by one. The subgraph.yaml has the smart contract in there that we defined through the CLI. We also have the start block in there and has high level, you're naming the entities. You're not really going into all the properties of them. Also, you're naming the event handlers. It's just a high level overview to just understand what your subgraph is doing. It really is the manifest. So you can see we have that punk transfer, defi not defined, just named right there. Let's keep on tracing that punk transfer. We'll go down to the automatically generated punk transfer handler, which is named handle punk transfer. So you have an event being emitted from chain. And then from there, this is going to start populating the entity of which you will start query. So you can see it's right here, a uh, let entity equal new punk transfer type. And now we have the entity being populated, the, the event that parens from becomes transferred or assigned to the entity dot from property. And literally it's just signing blockchain data directly to the entity for your query, okay? So let's go ahead and look at where your front end queries will go. You have the schema.graphql. This is how you will query using GraphQL queries. You have a entity with the ID from to punk index bytes, all that good information there for your front end to gather information from historical data. So once again, here we transfer, we went through the uh, punk transfer event, that is near for reference. If you need ideas of kind of how to go through a little bit more advanced, let's go into some queries right now, guys. So if you guys have time to uh, start to learn a little bit more about subgraphs, use these questions and compare the questions that are here. Could I answer these questions using the starter subgraph or do I need the more advanced subgraph? And like, how do you figure that out? How do you actually dive into that? Let's start with figuring out the punk transfers, the first 10 in the history of uh, CryptoPunks. So just going into the right here through the Explorer, 
you can just go ahead and start sending some test queries and go, and I wanted the first 10, so I ordered by the block timestamp. And then I had order direction being ascending, and then we're sort of send out that query for a test query. And this is the exact shape of the query on the left that you would send out to the API in. So you're just testing the queries in the playground, seeing what you want to do with that. So that was a pretty basic question. The first 10 transfers uh, in the history of uh, CryptoPunks. Um, oh yeah, I wanted to convert the timestamp to show you guys that actually is accurate. So you got to actually confirm that. Um, this is the timestamp of the first transaction in CryptoPunks history, 2017, on that date. Planned? Yeah. What about the next one? Find the total value in ETH sales of all punks ever. Let's just start with that. All right, that's a that's a pretty cool question. Now, with a starter subgraphs, you're like, well, how do we get that? How do we actually compute that? In this next subgraph, through Jerry Ocolo, he developed this subgraph and extended it a little bit. And in a subgraph, you can do a little bit of computation. You could actually do some processing. And in this subgraph, he does that. So what I'd recommend for you guys, figure out how he was able to compute that in his mappings. You can do that too. You can gather data from the blockchain and actually say, hey, I want uh, this information to have a little bit of computation and publish this to the query. And then you can actually gather that data. It really does the work for you in that way. It's really nice. So let's go ahead and go, I'm looking for the question here, find the total value in ETH sales. Jerry did very good documentation. And I'd recommend that if you are gonna be going through this, you wanna remember your computation. So you go to the schema.graphql. Remember, this is the last point where you actually send your queries to, your GraphQL queries. And on this, I'm looking for the total ETH sales in the history uh, of this. I'm just going through, going through, and I'm like, wait a minute, where is it, where is it? I know it's here somewhere. And there it is, total ETH sales for pump. So total sales forever. That's not gonna be on the blockchain. That requires some computation done in the mappings. And we don't have to dive into that right now, but what I want to do is just show you how you can go through the schema.graphql, query his subgraphs, and we know it's on the contract. And there we go. Blah. And, and the ID is gonna be the contract ID. You could actually, he defined it like so. So we the ID to contract address. So, and we want the total amount traded ever and then total sales and total supply. He named these through the mappings.ts5. He organically created these and documented very well. Please go into his documentation and see how he did this. I want this to be a learning opportunity for you guys to see how a basic starter subgraph does it and how a little bit more advanced does it, a little bit of math, a little bit of diving into it. So let's go ahead and continue with the slides. Before I go on, we're doing good on time. Any questions thus far? Yeah. You. Was, my question is just about the um, delay between the, uh, the event uh, publication on chain and the recording in the, in the graph uh, index or So yeah, how long does that take to... Uh, but if you index, how long does it take to index? Yeah. Depends on how much you want to index. I mean, mm -hmm. if you have a smart contract deployed at a certain point, you define that start block and then it'll start indexing. I mean, like, uh, once it's already deployed, mm -hmm. um, if you want, yeah, a system that want like, uh, like very, um, uh, near real time, uh, information. Like how fast response time? Yeah. This is last I heard on the network is around a uh, point, uh, I think it's 42 milliseconds. So that's pretty good. Okay. Yeah. For a team. Okay. Okay. Cool. And just one qu other question is about the tokenomics. If um, yeah, you want to run you uh, use a graph, uh, graph and the indexer. Yeah. What does that imply? Yeah. And, yeah. yeah. Is yeah. that? Yeah. Good question. Is it, is it removed at some point? Yeah. Great yeah. question. Great yeah. question. I'll, I'll go over this really quickly. Essentially, when you publish a subgraph to the network, you have to incentivize indexers around the world to get to work. So essentially, you're saying, how much do I want decentralization in my stack? If you only put a few tokens, you're not going to whole, have a whole lot of indexers hop in and start indexing your subgraph. If you put in a good number that we're saying across the board is 10,000 GRT, that gets many indexers to hop in and start indexing. So it just depends on the indexer, their hardware, and the subgraphs that they want to index. They want to make sure their hardware can handle. Maybe you're deploying a massive subgraph. So you want to make sure that the indexer can handle that. And so they have a choice on if they index or not. With 450, the market is pretty healthy with diving in with any subgraph you publish and have a reasonable amount of GRT, you're going to get indexed. 
Thank you. Uh, how can I integrate it into my DEP? Do, do you have any SDK or whatever? So we have an API endpoint, and you can use, we have what's called Graph Client, Apollo. Those, those are two different options for you, and you can send queries through that. It's very, it's nicely designed. So yeah, check, check out Apollo or Graph Client. API key? Uh, yes, there's an API key as well, and so I can go through that in a little bit as well. I'll pop you up with that. Yeah, yeah. Okay, let's keep, um, yes. Quick one, how's the schema uh, designed? Is it a standard schema? Yeah, let's, I mean, I can quickly go through that right now. Let's do that. So this is the schema right here. I mean, this is, does that help answer your question? You can definitely customize it. You can extend it to your heart's content. There's reverse lookups. There's there's a lot of things you can do with this. Yeah, that's a lot of power in there too. Yeah, good question. All right, let's keep on going. I got seven minutes. Awesome. Okay, so we're able to uh, go through the punk transfer event all the way through, and you can see how just with the boilerplate code of a uh, subgraph being spun up, you have a lot of power already. To do a little bit more mathematics, you need Jerry's subgraph or your own creativity. Let's keep on going. Like I said, these are for your reference. Go into this slideshow that's in that repo, and you can actually learn a little bit more about patterns that you're commonly seeing in subgraphs and how people are using them. I'll just skim through these really quickly. Please dive in on your own board. And we already compared queries with two different subgraphs. And then finally, this is something that I'm really excited about because you guys are all builders. Scaffold ETH 2, who's tried it? Or even Scaffold ETH 1. I, I love it. That's amazing. Yeah, there we go, Kevin. So uh, Kevin back there has put in an amazing, uh, uh, and also Simone has worked very hard together at building this repo right here. I don't know why I said no more QR codes. That's just, I apologize again. But this is a blog entry written by Kevin Jones, uh, specific uh, to combining a Scaffold ETH 2 repo with a subgraph. It's all Dockerized, it's all contained, and it has super fast feedback and happiness that feels really good when you are able to deploy your smart contract on hard hat, you're actually able to see the exact front end respond immediately and have a subgraph respond as well right away. It's this really amazing feedback loop. So um, Kevin, uh, Simon, cheers to you guys. Uh, great work with this. And if I were starting in a hackathon, this is where I would go. So um, workshop takeaways. Decentralized indexing is love. Uh, that's a good one. Deploy a starter subgraph uh, in Subgraph Studio. All right, just deploying a starter subgraph and querying it in your uh, hackathon project is enough to get some money. So that's pretty cool. You don't have to do anything crazy. Just a starter and query it. That's awesome. Uh, you can trace an event. That's a really good way to learn. You can start from front to back, from the schema all the way down to the blockchain, or go from the blockchain all the way to the schema and see how that is handled all the way through. Um, hopefully this video helped, this uh, interaction helped. Um, and then also really good way to learn subgraphs and subgraph development is just to play a starter subgraph, looking at a smart contract and look at one a little bit more advanced. And I provided that for you today. So you could see how that's done, compare how a little bit more advanced one is done with some good documentation and just you're off to the races. You're good to go. And Scaffold ETH is helpful too. Okay. So if you'd like to join the graph ecosystem, jobs, network roles, and community, go ahead and scan here. I'll never say that QR code thing again. <laughs> and once phones are down, are up. Okay. Oh, there we go. Phone. Phone. What okay. type? Boom. We're good. All right. And uh, Q and A. Fifty-three. All right. Uh, yeah, I was just wondering: is it possible to? have any access control over the entity mappings that you were sharing? So there is the authentication that you have. So it is on your computer authenticated. And so if there's anyone who's going to be hopping in, they need that authentication key. I showed mine publicly because that's my developer key. I don't really care. Um, but that would be the authentication code. You just need to authenticate them. The uh, role-based access as well. Um, uh, so you could have access into the subgraph. There is way, there are ways to have like a Gnosis multi-sig that has access into a subgraph and can actually use it and alter it at the dashboard level. And also at the code level, you have the, uh, uh, authentication that is that I copy pasted into the CLI. So anyone that has that authentication code got it by logging in appropriately, either through the multi-sig and that allows a lot of people to use it and then copy paste into the. Cool. Thanks. So
Uh, yes, I, I was wondering, is there a way to ask the indexer to like simulate an event so that... Simulate an event. So to simulate a transaction and index the resulting event, it, this would have use cases like, for example, in Uniswap, when you want to uh, get um, the fees that are accumulating, mm -hmm. you could just ask the indexer to simulate that several times. That's a good, that's a good question. Let's talk. Yep. Uh, I want to I open that up a little bit. That's a good question. Let's talk afterwards. Afterwards. Is that cool? Okay, okay perfect. cool. Perfect. All right. Thank you, Marcus. Thank you so much.